Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shaminda Connorsman. I'm from the University of California, San Diego, and it is an honor to be here. Uh, I'll be talking today about um, myotonic dystrophy type one. There is a, a subsequent session later today on type two. We're gonna cover disease development and symptom management. My, myotonic dystrophy type one is an adult muscular dystrophy and it is the most common adult muscular dystrophy in the world. The prevalence ranges in the literature anywhere from five to 20 per 100,000 people. However, uh, Dr. Johnson actually recently published a paper that suggests that the prevalence might actually be a lot higher. He did an article where he looked at the newborn screening rates in New York and determined that the prevalence of myotonic dystrophy by genetic testing was as high as one per 2,100 births. This begs the question that perhaps the condition is under-recognized or under-diagnosed. There are two types of myotonic dystrophy, of course. There's type one and type two. There um, are caused by two different mutations in two different genes. And DM1 in particular is a repeat expansion disorder. Um, there are definitely, there's definitely overlap between the symptoms between the two conditions. Both are considered what we call autosomal dominant, which means that there's a 50% chance that a child of a patient with myotonic dystrophy can inherit the disease. Um, that is much more predictable for type one myotonic dystrophy. The unusual thing, just like Dr. Thornton said, is that this condition affects multiple organs. Even though we consider it a neurological condition, it affects heart, for example, GI system, pulmonary, and multiple other organs, which makes it a very complex condition to study. And um, by the way, these are two of my wonderful patients, a mother and, and child. So myotonic dystrophy, let's get into the genetics a little bit. Myotonic dystrophy is caused by a gene called DMPK. It stands for dystrophia myotonica protein kinase. It's a bit of a mouthful. And it is caused by a CTG repeat expansion. CTG, those are like the, the codes of DNA. There are four different letters and it has three of them. We call that a triplet. And, and that triplet is actually going to be expanded and that is the cause of myotonic dystrophy. Patients who do not have myotonic dystrophy have a natural, uh, has, have a natural area of the gene that is the, where the triplet repeats are between five and 37 repeats long. On the diagram in the dark blue is the diagram representing the DMPK gene. Where the light blue arrow is, is actually on one end of the gene. That is where the, um, the actual mutation occurs. And if you have less than 37, you do not have myotonic dystrophy. If you have more than, if you have 51 or higher repeats, then there is the possibility, then, then you have myotonic dystrophy. And the, when the symptoms start actually depends on the repeat length. And there is definitely a correlation between the repeat length and when symptoms start and how severe the symptoms are with higher repeats causing earlier symptoms with um, with uh, more severe condition, more severe disease. When that happens, that's called anticipation. It is, um, it is a that's a genetic term. But when it gets worse from parent to child, and it and is more severe and earlier onset, there's a term that we refer to in medicine called genetic anticipation. You might hear about that. If you're between 35, 38 and 50 CTG repeats, then you have what's called a pre-mutation where you don't typically have symptoms. However, you may have a child with symptoms because the, the, this area of DNA is inherently unstable and it can actually uh, cause symptoms in a child. Here is a table that I slightly modified from its original publication showing the amount of repeat length, the, the length of the, uh, of the repeat on the right side of the table compared to the phenotype or when the symptoms start. 
So for example, the congenital myotonic dystrophy type one patients where it typically starts at, at birth or shortly thereafter, they typically have 750 to 1400 repeats. Whereas if you are what we consider the classic, typically adult onset myotonic dystrophy type one, um, you have anywhere from 100 to about 1,000 repeats. Um, it can range from 10 to 30 years of age in terms of when it starts. It is very common for mothers with myotonic dystrophy to not know that they have myotonic dystrophy and until a child is born who is what we medically call floppy because they're very low in tone, that is when sometimes the physicians and the patient first re recognizes that, that mom actually had myotonic dystrophy. That's a very common scenario that we see in medicine. Like I said, this area of DNA is unstable, which is why it actually can expand from generation to generation. It also expands over a patient's lifetime. So if a tissue, for example, is multiplying, like for example, skin, if it's a, if it's a multiplying type of tissue, then that, ex that repeat expansion can also uh, get worse over time and also result in more symptoms. In terms of congenital myotonic dystrophy, type one, it's, it's usually maternally inherited, meaning from the mother, but it doesn't have to be. It can be inherited from the father as well. It is more common to see the repeat be a little bit more stable or even contract, meaning get smaller, uh, if it is inherited by the father. That is because, or what we think is happening, is that sperm that have a very big mutation don't make it. So as a result, the sperm that have the smaller mutation is what ends up fertilizing the egg. That's, what, that's the current leading hypothesis on that. Um, when you have congenital myotonic dystrophy, typically you're, you have a larger repeat length, anywhere from 750 to 1400 CTG repeats. And mom's pregnancy could be complicated by polyhydramnios. What that means is there's too much amniotic fluid. And that's because baby can't swallow the fluid like he's, he or she is supposed to. Mom may also recognize that the baby is not quite moving as much. And if that does happen, that uh, usually the doctor will need to monitor that and actually make sure that the baby is okay. Kids born with congenital myotonic dystrophy are floppy, meaning that they have low tone. It also makes it difficult for the little one to breathe and um, feed on their own. So many, many children actually need um, breathing help. It can be anywhere from just a, a, a mask, but off or an intubation. Uh, and that might require a tracheostomy later. Often patients with myotonic dystrophy with congenital form can actually get the trach out because patients do often get stronger with age. There is something called arthrogryposis, which means that the, um, that the joints get really tight. And that's, um, the baby can be born that way. And it is possible with, uh, with a good rehab specialist or an orthopedic surgeon to get the, get the um, joints to be less tight with something called casting. Like I said, many kids do require ventilation. The mortality is awfully high. It's about 25%, but with good medical care, it is it's very possible for these ch children to survive. The, the big picture that you see is one of my, my patients, and you can see that she actually has an old trach scar um, on her, uh, at her throat. So she needed to be intubated and had a trach when she was little, and then later on, she was able to get uh, what we call decannulated, got, get it taken out. You can also see the joint tightness, especially evident on panel C, the little, the, the small baby that is uh, on the ventilator. You can see that the joints are really tight, especially across the knee and, um, and feet. And the, the legs being out is part of the, the low tone. Now, this is a important slide because this will actually tie us back into the treatments. Um, this is a slide depicting what happens with the repeat expansion. So remember that the DNA is expanded, it's a lot bigger than it should be. And that results in something called a toxic RNA. 
Now, the RNA is the blue strip, and it, the RNA forms a loop. We call it a hairpin loop. And um, the, it's very similar to a loop on a bobby pin, for example. And when you form loops in your, in your cells, it needs to be stabilized. And the stabilizing molecule is the a magenta ball. It's called muscle blind like. So I don't, it's too much for me to say. I just, I'm just gonna call it muscle blind um, moving forward. And they actually come and stabilize the loop. The problem is in that in myotonic dystrophy, the loops are so long and it takes up so much muscle blind. It just kind of soaks up a lot of the muscle blind and not leave any of the muscle blind available for other genes to do their job. This results in muscle blind amount going down. And unfortunately, there's another set of proteins called KELF proteins that go up. That is not a good balance for your cells. And it actually causes other genes to not be made correctly. Some of those genes are actually on the slide. There's the C, T, and T, which is a cardiac troponin. There's a there's a, um, a channel in your muscles that actually is not made that causes the myotonia, for example. And it's actually depicted on this one. So fundamentally, DMPK mutation actually causes a toxic RNA to form, which messes up with the, with the making of other gene, other proteins from other genes. And the chloride channel is not getting made, which then results in the classic myotonia, which is the, the difficulty with releasing the grip. There is actually an increase of a different enzyme called glycogen synthase kinase, which then is responsible uh, potentially for the muscle atrophy. There's cardiac troponin that might be responsible for the abnormal heart rhythms. It's, it's the cardiac troponin is not getting made. And then there is insulin receptor that is not getting made. And if without insulin, you actually can develop diabetes. So we've figured out some of the pathways on, on how this happens. And that can actually, figuring out more of the pathways can actually then result in potential treatment interventions. So now let's talk about DM care. Now, ideally in quite a few patients, it's important to actually get care from multiple doctors. To make it easy for our patients, we often take care of our patients in multidisciplinary teams, where as many doctors as possible get together and actually see our patient all in one visit just to make it easy for our patients. Um, oftentimes, it might, uh, it might involve a, a neurologist, a rehab specialist, um, I, I even forgot to put physical therapists on there, um, pulmonologist, cardiologist, social worker, uh, GI specialist. Not all of them are in the exact same visit, but we try to lump as many of them as possible. Some patients who are very mild don't need to see multiple specialists, but I think it is important for the patient to see at the least a neurologist and, and a, likely a cardiologist to get your care um, streamlined and if necessary, then they can refer out. Let's talk about each symptom one by one and more importantly, the treatments or options that you have to help manage those symptoms. One of the most common symptoms in DM1 is weakness. And weakness often happens first in the hands and feet. It often causes difficulty with gripping. You can actually have the problems with the relaxation. Then it can also cause weakness. Anything that has to do with fine dexterous hand movements, um, opening things. My patients also, and patients in general, often have a lot of low back pain. And that is partly because the muscles of your back are not as strong. And as a result, it can't support your spine. Um, it's partly from the muscle weakness. It can also be uh, from the scoliosis that some patients have. Droopy eyelids is a common symptom. Um, it's known as ptosis. Facial weakness also happens. Usually that's not that big of a problem, uh, but it can actually be part of the reason for the, um, the slurred speech. And weakness is usually slow and steady over a patient's lifetime. There is a correlation between your repeat expansion and the weakness. My patients complain of a lot of fatigue that is partly from the muscle weakness. It can also be what we call central nervous system fatigue. It's a brain issue as well as there's also some muscle pain that my patients, uh, that patients in general talk about, and it's mostly in the legs. 
Now, in terms of treatment, um, it is very important that your monitoring physician actually evaluates your strength across time. And that can actually um, help the physician gear various things based on what, what symptoms you have. One of the easiest and most, um, uh, one of the easiest ways to actually help you prevent falls, for example, and actually improve your gait and help preserve energy is something called an AFO, uh, which is the, the, um, the orthotic that you see in the middle of the slide there. It actually will help prevent falls in some patients. You should be evaluated by a physical therapist or a, a physician, a physiatrist for it. Um, and they can actually tailor your AFO for your needs. Um, my, some patients might require um, walkers to help stabilize their, their core um, and help make it safer. Power wheelchairs, I, I personally think of power wheelchairs as a aid for my patient's independence. It lets my patient do what, what they want. Um, I, I completely empathize when my patient has a hard time realizing that they need to possibly use a power chair for long distances, for example. Um, physical therapy is a huge partner of mine when I take care of my patients in terms of making sure that my patients are safe and they get what they need. One of the fundamental, wonderful things that you can do for yourself that I, I unfortunately cannot do for you is exercise regularly. And that actually helps maintain your function. It, um, there's data showing that both aerobic and light to medium weights, if, as long as you use good technique, can actually be very helpful. Coming back to that low back pain that might actually shoot down your leg, it's, uh, it's commonly referred to as sciatica. Medically, it's re referred to as something called a radiculopathy. It's because a nerve in the back can get pinched. So you can see on the diagram that the nerves are in yellow and there are all these muscles in your back. And if the muscles are slightly weak from the myotonic dystrophy, discs can move out of place um, and your, your spine may not be as stable. And, and when a disc moves out of place, you, it, it, it can pinch a nerve, for example, and cause that shooting pain. Because back pain with shooting pain actually kind of comes and goes, if my patient is suffering from this repeatedly, we try to come up with a plan on what to do when the pain happens. It usually incorporates some, it usually re uh, requires medications that you can easily get over the counter, like Tylenol, low potency, low potency narcotics, um, ibuprofen, which is an NSAID. I refer my patient to physical therapy so that they can get a stretching uh, regimen going at home when it happens. It's actually important to stay active um, while this is happening, if it is unbearable, we uh, usually connect you to an interventional radiologist that can give a little bit of local anesthetic to calm down that nerve that is shooting off. And uh, it unfortunately can go away, but also come back. Fatigue, one of the, um, what really helps with that is regular exercise. And I will talk in another slide uh, about what to do about CNS fatigue. And um, myotonia, which is part of my patients describe it as muscle stiffness, is actually a prolonged hand grip. It actually, um, it can be in certain instances, instances be perceived as being painful. When it happens in the tongue, for example, it can slur my patient's speech. Um, there are medications that can be given to this. One common one is mexilatine. Um, it actually kind of calms down the muscle so that it actually can relax better. That cannot be given, that medicine cannot be given to patients with known heart disease. There's another medicine called carbamazepine. I'm wondering if I can play the video. Oh, it's one of my patients with myotonia. This is a maneuver that your doctor might do in the office, especially when they're first diagnosing you. It's a, they, you, hit the muscle and then it, it moves on its own. Now let's go on to pulmonary issues. Pulmonary complications are very critical complications. And fortunately, even though it is a very serious one, it is something that we can get in front of. And this is something that can actually be made better. The pulmonary issues stem from the muscle weakness of breathing muscles, the diaphragm and the rib muscles. Um, it, there's also a component of an ineffective cough. 
you can't actually cough up your mucus, for example, if you are sick, um, which can then unfortunately lead to pneumonia. My patients can also have weakness in their throat muscles that can actually increase the re risk of um, aspiration, which is where you pull your food or your drink down into your lungs, which can then cause a pneumonia as well. There's also sleep apnea. Now, sleep apnea has, uh, is also known as obstructive sleep apnea. That can actually cause quite a few symptoms, which can be helped with a, either a CPAP machine or a BiPAP machine. Your lung doctor can actually help you figure out which one is the best one for you at the time. Um, sometimes pulmonary issues are very slow and it may not cause symptoms, but that's why your doctor might actually test your lungs periodically. It could be once a year, it could be uh, twice a year, depending on how your previous lung testing did. Um, a lot of daytime sleepiness is very common, um, and that's partly from the apnea. Fatigue, like I said, the fatigue is partly muscular, but is partly also brain related. Headaches in the morning is a very common symptom of obstructive sleep apnea that is not treated. And that actually is not a good sign. If that keeps happening to you, you definitely need to bring that up with your doctor. And you can actually feel short of breath when you're lying down as well. However, this is something that we can do something about. Your doctor will probably do lung testing. Like I said, He'll, they'll monitor something called an FVC. If it's below 50%, which is your ability to breathe in and out fully, um, you, your doctor will probably refer to your lung doctor and which point they will try to figure out if it's something that needs to be just monitored or treated. Usually it needs to be treated with the, uh, something called a bi-level ventilation. The common term is actually BiPAP, but that's a brand name. I like to use the term bi-level. Um, your doctor can also monitor your ability to cough. And there's a way to actually figure out if you're bringing out enough air. And if it is too low, you can get something called an insufflator exufflator. I actually like the way that sounds, but um, the, the brand name for that is a cough assist machine. And you can actually see the, 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 the middle panel in there where you can, it actually feels a little awkward, I'm told by my patients, because it actually kind of um, helps put in air and then push it out just like a regular cough. And it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it can be very helpful, especially if you're fighting off an infection. If there's a pneumonia, we need to treat that right away. So you need to call your neurologist or lung doctor if you already have one right away because we do not want you to land in the hospital. Untreated pneumonias is actually very dangerous um, um, and it can actually lead to something called sepsis, which is a blood infection. Um, often patients do need a referral to a pulmonologist. We've been always uh, advocating for vaccinations. Pneumonia vaccine, roughly every 10 years annual flu shot, and now we have been advocating for the COVID vaccine. Now, in terms of treatments, like I said before, there's something called a bi-level ventilator, also known as a BiPAP machine. There are other brand names. Um, it's given to patients with low ability to breathe, which gets even lower while you're sleeping. Oftentimes the symptoms start uh, at night and um, it can progress throughout into the day as the disease progresses. And there is an actual um, publication saying that if you can use your, your bi-level or BiPAP every night for at least five hours, it actually can improve your survival. So we always try to encourage our patients to use it throughout the night. I know it's uncomfortable, especially at the beginning, but I do have some amazing patients who say that it's actually very helpful. It can actually uh, increase your energy level, improve your survival, and also um, um, help you do the things during the day. And of course, it can decrease your daytime sleepiness. If it's not comfortable, like the mask, for example, definitely talk to your lung doctor. Especially, like I said before, in the little babies, they may need a lot of help with their breathing. They often need a tracheostomy, like I had mentioned. Um, that's what happened with the lungs over time in most myotonic dystrophy patients. It's usually a slow, gradual process, but sometimes it could be very quick. And it's usually because of a pneumonia. If you have sudden shortness of breath, especially if you're fighting off a cold or something and you don't feel good, definitely need to talk to your doctor right away. 
And you might need, if you're really having difficulty breathing and you're fatiguing, you might need to be put on a ventilator and hopefully a doctor can get you off that ventilator as quickly as possible. The other major issue that affects myotonic dystrophy patients is rhythm disturbances of the heart. Now, there are multiple names for this, and it could be a low heart rate. It could be what we call heart block. The diagram at the bottom, I, I kind of like it, even though it's very simple. Um, the yellow strands are the electrical circuits of your heart, and they're two big nodes that actually generate the electricity. You notice on the right-hand diagram, there's an area that's, that's a strand that's black. That's because that electrical um, circuit is actually not working. That's what we call heart block. And there's second degree and third degree heart block that is actually pretty serious. And if that's found, you're, you're, you, um, on an EKG, for example, or a long-term EKG called a Holter, your doctor will definitely refer you to a cardiologist who might talk to you about getting a pacer inserted. An another type of heart rhythm disturbance is atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. It is when the top of the heart is actually beating really fast and not letting the ventricles fill up with blood. There's something called ventricular fibrillation and ventricular flutter that is actually very dangerous. It can cause a patient to suddenly um, faint. And if um, emergency medical services do not come to you, unfortunately it can cause brain damage. So we, we can definitely avoid this by actually getting EKGs done at least once a year and getting um, um, long-term EKGs called halters done. Um, symptoms of heart issues can be anything from a fast beating heart, chest pain, feeling short of breath, feeling lightheaded, especially if it's accompanied by um, the fast heart rate. If you faint, you definitely need to bring that to your doctor's attention. Um, like I said, an EKG is often, is recommended in myotonic dystrophy. They might do a long-term EKG called a Holter. It's usually at 24 hours. There's even one that can go for days, uh, a loop recorder. Your doctor will also do an echo, which is a heart ultrasound. And sometimes our physicians also do something called a cardiac MRI. It's a really good picture of your heart and it can actually show scarring that an echo can miss. So once every few years, your doctor may actually do that, um, especially if the heart doctor is a specialist in, in muscle diseases like myotonic dystrophy. Most patients should be seen at least annually. If you are rock solid and no problems at all, sure, it can be done every two years, but you should be continually seen um, for uh, your heart rhythm monitoring. If a rhythm disturbance is found, your doctor can actually prescribe you a medicine that can actually calm down the rhythm and potentially correct it. Those medicines include beta blockers, digoxin, and like I said, pacers are sometimes necessary if you have heart block. Um, and if you have one of the dangerous rhythms, the ventricular rhythms, your doctor will talk to you about something called a defibrillator. And um, here's a diagram showing what a pacer box typically looks like. It's usually put on the left side of your chest and there are wires coming out of it going into the heart. And if we find a heart block, this can actually make sure that the heart is actually going and not causing any pauses. If your heart pumping ability is low, uh, anywhere from 40 to 50%, the current guideline is to actually also putting a ICD and a pacer in, in the same box. That way you don't need to undergo a second surgery. Um, heart failure is the other heart issue that can happen. So heart failure is basically the uh, inability for the heart to pump. There are two different types. It's because the heart is not strong enough or it's because the heart is so thick that it can't fill up all the way. And the symptoms of which are actually um, very similar to other symptoms of, caused by other issues like lungs. So your doctor will actually need to try to tease out what's causing the symptoms. It includes feeling really tired, um, feeling short of breath, a very fast heart rate, swelling in your legs, um, losing your appetite, having a rapid weight gain, um, and having to pee all the time. Unfortunately, these symptoms are very, very common. So 
your doctor actually will need to do a little bit of work to figure out what's going on because they have to have, actually have to tease out which what is what. Now, it's very common for my patients to actually be seen by a heart doctor, but also a specialized heart doctor called an electrophysiologist that's actually a rhythm doctor. So they, they are specialized in pacers, for defibrillators. And that can be a little bit confusing for our patients to be seen by two heart doctors, but that's because they specialize in two different aspects of the heart. Um, the medications for heart failure are often in, are, are going to be geared towards your symptoms or your what your heart is doing. Sometimes you need a medicine to help it pump harder. Sometimes you need a medicine to help the heart relax so that it can actually fill up with blood more. So it, your doctor will actually uh, prescribe to you the correct medicine depending on your studies and how you're doing. Um, like I said, a defibrillator is often re um, recommended for patients who have a pumping ability of 50% or less. I have had a few patients who um, actually received a heart transplant because their heart actually failed but their muscles are actually relatively stronger. And if, that, and that, if that's the case, that there are a few rare patients who can receive a heart transplant. Now let's talk about the brain symptoms. Now, the myotonic dystrophy type one has Lot, has cognitive as well as other brain symptoms. Um, it can range from having no brain symptoms to having very severe brain symptoms. Cognitive issues are known to happen and that can include a reduced IQ. Um, little, uh, small children with congenital myotonic dystrophy can have learning issues and it's very important to do neuropsychiatric testing or IQ testing so that those kids can get the specialized care that they need or have an educational program that's tailored to them. Memory problems often um, can happen, especially with age. Um, patients might notice that things that they were able to do 10 years ago without any problems, like very complex cognitive tasks, like their taxes, for example, might be getting more harder for them to do. Um, patients can have an increased risk of mood disorders, including uh, depression and anxiety. And patients, um, when if a brain scan is done on you, there are uh, it is known that you can have what's called white matter lesions. This is a known issue with myotonic dystrophy. It doesn't mean that you had a stroke. Usually when you see white matter lesions, you worry about small strokes um, that were didn't have symptoms, but that's not necessarily what's happening. But it is a known issue, and you can see that on panel C, that the little white fluffy stuff at the bottom, that's actually not supposed to be there, but that's what we call a white matter lesion. Also, brain volume can go down um, in this condition. Fortunately, there are things that can be done. There's one intervention that has actually been shown to help with increased activity and participation and the issue with lack of motivation, and that's called cognitive behavioral therapy, and is usually done by a psychologist. Psychiatric and neuropsychological testing can help tailor, especially for children, what they need help with. And I have wonderful social workers that I work with um, who, who are an amazing help and resource for my patients, and they can help with aspects that are not, less, not necessarily medical, but they're more social, such as um, how to access caregiver services, how to access financial assistance, transportation to the clinic or to other, um, other um, areas and then various state or local organ organizations that your doctor may not be necessarily aware of, but your social worker is um, fully informed. These two are, uh, these uh, Jane and Deb are two of my social workers who are actually gonna participate in some of the discussions tomorrow. Now let's talk about sleep issues in terms of how it, um, uh, how it manifests. There are several sleep issues. There's the apnea that we talked about. Then there's the daytime sleepiness, and that's partly from obstructive sleep apnea, if especially if you have it, and is partly from the brain. Um, there's also something called, so, so sleep apnea as an obstructive sleep apnea is where your upper airway actually closes down while you're sleeping. Um, and that's because of muscle weakness in the upper airway. That is best treated with BiPAP or bi-level. 
Um, central sleep apnea is a brain issue where your brain is not actually triggering you to breathe at night when it's of course supposed to. Um, RLS is restless leg syndrome that can also happen. REM, sleep behavior disorder, is where you are acting out your dreams at night. When you're in REM sleep, you're supposed to not be moving. But you can dream, but then not, not have to like dance or do anything that you're actually dreaming about. But unfortunately, what happens is that there is an uh, a, um, issue in the brain where those two things are no longer connected, where you are actually, your, your muscles are actually can move. And unfortunately, it can actually, you can end up hurting yourself or your bed partner. Um, and many of my patients have the next one. It's called sleep phase disorders, where my patients actually stay awake all night and sleep during the day. Um, and on that, that often happens. Um, it's very common when you're a teenager, but it also happens in my patients and that gently needs to be reversed back. Um, periodic limb movements of sleep is when you're moving your legs after you fall asleep in a certain stage of sleep. All of these things, the best way besides talking to you is to actually do a sleep study. There are two main ways of getting a sleep study. There's of course the one in the lab, uh, which actually look at all the monitors that, that are on. There's a monitor on your brain for your brain waves. There's a monitor on your, um, on your muscles to see if you're actually breathing. There's a pulse ox. There's, you can even do carbon dioxide testing. There are all these monitors and you're supposed to sleep like that in the lab so we can figure out what's going on with your sleep. I am told that it is a bugger. And um, there is another option of home testing is just not as good. The data is not as good, unfortunately. So some of my patients may opt to do the home testing. And if the data is good, we got it, then fine. But if not, unfortunately, you may have to come into the sleep lab. One of the core things that we actually tell our patients is to have good sleep hygiene. This is true for me as a physician, it's true for you. Um, if you have myotonic dystrophy, it's true for everyone. This actually will help us regulate our sleep-wake cycle. You're supposed to go to bed at a certain time, uh, at hopefully the same time roughly every day, wake up at the same time. Uh, you shouldn't be reading a screen in bed and not even actually reading a book in bed because you're only supposed to sleep in bed. Um, um, and that's because your brain will correlate something active with the bed. So you're supposed to disconnect them. You're not supposed to have caffeine after 4 p.m. Oh my goodness, I have caffeine right before I go to bed. Um, I, you have ex you're supposed to exercise during the day so that you're actually, you, you feel like you're, you can then need the restoration that you need from the sleep. I am a violator of these sleep hygiene practices, but, um, but it does actually help. It certainly helps my sleep if I can actually do all these things. And we, that's one of the first things that your pulmonary doctor or your sleep doctor or your neurologist will tell you. It's because those, those signals, your brain actually needs to have a normal regulated sleep-wake cycle. The bi-level can help a lot with your sleep. It takes, um, my patients tell me it takes some getting used to and you need to have a good fit uh, for it to work. But once it does work, my patients tell me that they would not go anywhere without their machine, that they like to take it with them because they feel so much better when they do wake up. There is another medicine, especially if you have a lot of sleepiness during the day and you're wearing a bi-level if you have obstructive sleep apnea and you're still sleepy during the day, there's a medicine that I have prescribed to my patients called modafinil, also known as ProVigil. It helps you stay awake. It's an alerting drug. Um, it is a controlled substance. So unfortunately, I can't give a lot of medicine at, a, at one time. I have to keep prescribing it. Um, but it is a known medication for this condition, for this particular symptom. Okay, now endocrine and metabolic issues do happen in myotonic dystrophy. It, one of them is low sex hormones. It includes testosterone and the precursors for estrogen and testosterone called LH and FSH. It is partly responsible for the hair loss that's seen in uh, males and, and also females. Um, testicular atrophy that's seen in men. It can also um, be the cause of the infertility in some people. Um, and it does have a correlation with the actual expansion. There's a high risk of diabetes because of this condition. And now hopefully we understand why, because the insulin receptor is not getting made. 
So your doctor should be checking A1C, which is the diabetes test that most doctors check for um, annually. And there is another test called the fast, fasting blood sugar that can be done, but the convention is to do an A1C. Um, there's a high risk of thyroid problems. It could be high thyroid or low, low thyroid. So your TSH and T, free T4 should be checked annually as well. Patients with myotonic dystrophy are known to have problems with their cholesterol. We call that a metabolic syndrome. The cholesterol, good cholesterol could be low, bad cholesterol could be high. Triglycerides, which is basically um, correlates with the fat in your food most of the time, um, can also be high. Um, your doctor should be doing a fasted lipid, lipid panel annually, and you might need a cholesterol medicine. One of, the, one of the ways that you can get that under control is to manage your weight and, and eat healthy. Calcium metabolism, especially a, a hormone in, um, in your body called a, I'm sorry, a gland in your body called a parathyroid gland can be off and it can cause problems with calcium metabolism. And, and unfortunately it can lead to bone loss. And your doctor should be checking vitamin D levels calcium and parathyroid hormone levels, and, and it can be a contributor to low bone density. Low bone density happens in myotonic dystrophy, partly because of calcium issues, but partly because of the weakness. Whenever you have weakness, you are always going to have low bone density, um, but exercise can help with that. So of course, if you're found to be a diabetic, you should get that treated right away. And a part of being a diabetic is monitoring your sugar intake and your weight. And amazingly, um, metformin can actually be helpful um, for controlling diabetes, but also um, something else that I will talk about in just a minute. Interestingly, when even though patients have testosterone deficiency, there's an article that showed that testosterone replacement does not actually improve the strength in muscles in, in um, DM1. Now, if you have a thyroid abnormality, it is vital that you actually get that properly diagnosed and that it gets treated. It is a known thing in medicine that if you have a thyroid problem, it can actually definitely lead to muscle weakness. And you don't wanna have that on top of your myotonic dystrophy. And fortunately it can be treated and that aspect of muscle strength can be restored. I want all of you guys to know this. I have a few patients here and there where Another doctor, perhaps a doctor that doesn't know as much about myotonic dystrophy, checks liver numbers, liver panel, and the liver panel is high, specifically the AST and ALT. And they think that my patient has a problem with their liver. It's actually not a problem with your liver. It's a problem, it's, it's, a, it's a cross reaction. The fact that those two enzymes actually cross react with your muscle enzymes is actually a feature of the myotonic dystrophy. There's actually nothing wrong with the liver. So please don't let anybody do a liver biopsy on you or do too many scans that are not necessary, especially if they think you have a liver issue and the actual liver numbers, which are bilirubins, GGT, um, are normal. If you have any questions and some doctor wants to poke you in the liver, call your neurologist and let them know that this is happening so that, that, that the issue can be cleared up, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, GI issues are very common. It can be anything from the swallowing problem, constipation, diarrhea. The constipation and diarrhea can actually alternate. A lot of abdominal pain, heartburn. Um, patients have something... Have, can have something called pseudo obstruction of the intestines. That's where you, where your intestines suddenly don't work. And unfortunately we think it's related to the nervous system of the gut where suddenly it just gets paralyzed for a moment and your intestines stop moving and you actually feel like you can't, there's nothing that passes and you act, and it presents like your intestines are blocked. And this can cause abdominal bloating, a lot of pain. Um, you're a doctor in the emergency room might think that your intestines suddenly stopped working, which is true, but it, it can be caused by something outside pressing on it. 
And I do want to implore you that this can happen and that you shouldn't go to surgery to figure out if there's something that's blocking the intestine. There is nothing that's blocking the intestine. It's just because of this momentary paralysis, if you will, of the intestine. You just need support to try to, you need fluids to make sure you don't get dehydrated. You might need pain medicines to help deal with the pain and it will go away. Um, so please be careful about, um, about abdominal surgeries that are ultimately unnecessary if this happens to you. Gallstones also happen in higher frequency in DM1. These GI issues are actually known to happen with a little bit more, it's a little bit more common in females than males. Um, and they can certainly happen in pediatric patients. Um, a GI specialist who has an understanding of the neurological aspects of your GI system would actually be ideal. Um, if not, at most centers, for example, a GI specialist will at least take it upon themselves to learn about myotonic dystrophy and what the GI issues are. There are actually um, treatments that you can get, um, starting with the swallowing. If you're having difficulty swallowing, that can be actual feeling like it's getting stuck or you uh, have, I've had patients where, where fluid comes out of the nose because of like whatever they were drinking, or um, you actually have what's called recurrent pneumonias because you're pulling the food down into the wrong, uh, into the lungs. Um, getting a swallow study can be very helpful because we can figure out what to change in the diet. Sometimes it needs to be eliminated. Sometimes it needs to be just modified. Once in a while, my patient, especially if they lose a lot of weight, um, they will need a G-tube because you just can't get enough nutrition by modifying food. And it might need be, it's, it's um, I do talk to my patients extensively about this. And if they don't want the G-tube, that's absolutely fine. But the G-tube can help hydrate you, actually give you medicines and actually get enough food and whatever you can eat by mouth, you can still eat, but it can actually get the nutrition that you need. Um, diarrhea and constipation, especially them alternating is, is a very common issue. We need to do the high fiber diet if you're constipated and that needs to be coupled with more water. There is actually loperamide that you can get for the diarrhea, laxatives for the constipation. First line drugs that we typically give are Miralax and Senna. Second line drugs are actually for, usually for hyperactive bowel. They're what we call medicines for irritable bowel syndrome. They're unusual medicines and that typically requires some sort of specialized care, like from the GI specialist. They're called lubiprostone and um, anaclolide, anaclotide. There's also reglin, also known as metaclopramide for the, the sudden paralysis of the gut or the stomach. Now, the ptosis can actually impair your vision if it falls below into the pupil. And that is usually when it, we intervene. Otherwise, we don't typically intervene. Another issue is cataracts. Um, it can actually happen way before any, uh, any symptom is noticed or any drastic symptom is noticed, such as the weakness. Needing glasses for nearsightedness is very common. You can also have a lazy eye, medically called strabismus. If you look at my little kiddo, you can notice that her left eye is slightly towards the nose. Um, and that's because she has very subtle strabismus. Um, she, um, you can also have something called astigmatism. And the retina it can be um, abnormal. My patient on the right um, had needed, to uh, needed glasses for um, um, a very early on. If you've ever been to the eye doctor, that fancy piece of equipment that you have to sit in front of and put your chin on, that's called a slit lamp. And it's actually lets, it's a basically a very fancy microscope with a light. And the doctor can actually look, and it's usually an ophthalmology doctor, they can look at the surface of your eye, your cornea, your lens, your, and the back of your eye and everything in between very, very carefully. Um, cataracts is depicted in the lower picture. It's basically a cloudy lens. It can impair your vision. And fortunately, that actually is very treatable. Um, and of course, there's a higher risk of cataracts if you have diabetes. Um, patients complain of blurred vision. Everything looks dimmer, darker. Um, and it can actually be very dramatic when you go from very light conditions to very dark conditions. 
Now, when it comes to treating the ptosis, there is something called an eyelid crutch. It's, just, it's, it's a special thing that's attached to your glasses. And when you put your glasses on, you, it actually kind of picks up your eyelid by this thing kind of pushing up into your eyelid and helps no longer cover the pupil. There's also surgery that can be done. The surgery is called a blepharoplasty. There are several types of surgery. The old school surgery is the what's on the top panel. Is actually you, they isolate the muscle that is weak and they stitch it up higher in the orbit, basically. However, nowadays we do something called a frontalis suspension. Your doctor may refer to it as a, as a sling. I didn't quite realize this, but there are like six different ways to do the sling. And the one that seems to be used the most in, in terms of uh, its reference to myotonic dystrophy is the Pentagon um, is the Pentagon shaped sling. Basically, you're you're suturing the the muscle that's falling down into the the muscle that's on the top of your head right here called the frontalis muscle. And, and when they're connected, it actually helps the eye pick up a little bit and you no longer have ptosis. This is done by your eye doctor. Um, vast majority of the time. Unfortunately, because it's, there's a muscular dystrophy going on, failure of the surgery is very common seven year, several years later. Um, so your doctor will try to wait as long as possible if you need a repeat surgery, and you can only get so many surgeries in your lifetime near the eye. So we try to wait as long as possible. The next thing is tumors. Now, it is actually um, a pretty critical cause of um, a, a pretty critical issue in this condition. And it has benign tumors and malignant tumors like cancers. The benign tumors, uh, um, excuse me, the diabetes actually has a correlation with tumors. And interestingly, metformin can actually decrease and have a protective effect on tumor burden. So if you have diabetes, getting metformin for your diabetes can also help out with the tumor issue. There are benign tumors called pilomatrixomas, which is actually what's shown in the picture. It's a, it's a hard lump usually under the skin um, and it's um, more common in the facial area or the head and is less common in the body and arms and legs. Um, there's also a salivary gland tumor called a uh, pleomorphic adenoma, and there are the cancers. The cancers are anywhere from brain cancer to skin cancer, like ovary, testes, colon, and skin cancer includes melanoma and basal cell carcinoma. These are just, these are the common cancers uh, in medicine. Now, the risk in myotonic dystrophy is as high as one8 times compared to a, a general population is not quite double the risk, but it is close. Despite that, the actual surveillance and monitoring is actually the same as the general population. They do need to tailor, tailor it for your family history, your personal history. And um, for example, if there's a family member who has a history of breast cancer, then your surveillance as a female for breast cancer should be tailored depending on um, what the family member had. So the, your doctor should be made aware of not just the cancer history, but your myotonic dystrophy history. Um, we uh, often have to refer a patient to um, a dermatologist. It is recommended that you actually monitor your own skin regularly. And if something um, is going on, you can bring it up to your primary care doctor. And if the primary care doctor doesn't know, then a dermatology referral is actually recommended. And if you have diabetes, of course, you get it treated promptly. And then let's talk about pregnancy and um, in, in myotonic dystrophy. If you're sexually active, um, then a patient should be made aware of the transmission risk. The fact that 50% of all children can inherit the condition. If a patient wants to have a family, then you should be referred to a family, um, uh, sorry, a genetic counselor who can help with flat family planning. There is something called prenatal genetic diagnosis where um, you can actually, once you have a baby, you can actually figure out if the baby has the condition or not doing something called an amniocentesis or uh, chorionic villus sampling, for example. 
um, and then you can make a determination on what to do with the results. And then there's something also called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And this is something that some of my patients have undergone. It is horrendously expensive and it may not be covered by your insurance. But what that is, is you, you take your patient's um, eggs, you take sperm, um, and then you fertilize the egg and you try to see if the embryo actually has mitonic dystrophy. And if the embryo does not, then you actually do in vitro fertilization and implant the, the embryo into the mother. Um, like I said, it's really expensive, but that is something that can be considered. Um, women with mitonic dystrophy do have an increased risk of miscarriage. They have a higher risk of having a baby preterm. The, they can actually get tired during labor. So it is, um, they can get tired during labor and they can also have difficulties breathing in the third trimester, which is very common, but it can be even more so for uh, a DM1 mom. Um, if you're pregnant, then you should definitely consult with something called a, somebody called a high-risk OBGYN. That's an OBGYN that has specialized training in um, comp patients with complex medical conditions. At the time of delivery, it's ideal if, the, if you deliver in the hospital as opposed to home. Um, remember that moms can actually get tired very quickly um, and it might be necessary to convert to a C-section. Vaginal is preferred, but if a mom is too weak, even before the baby is born, it might be better to actually plan for the C-section ahead of time. And, um, and on standby, oftentimes the doctor will, the, the OBGYN will call in a neonatologist or a pediatric specialist to help with the baby, especially if the baby's status is not known, uh, to help with the, excuse me, with the breathing aspects and um, uh, soon after delivery. And they'll be on standby in the delivery room. Um, anesthesia, you do need to be worried if you are undergoing a surgery and let your doctor, your surgeon, and your anesthesiologist know that you have myotonic dystrophy because you, when you are exposed to these medicines, it can actually have, the effect can last longer than in the general population. So I really don't like succinylcholine. It paralyzes your muscles. It can last a heck of a lot longer in my patients with myotonic dystrophy. Oftentimes it's not necessary, or um, so I like to tell that to my anesthesiology do uh, doctor. Um, if you do get an opioid because you need it for pain, then they need to be aware that it might linger longer and that the anesthesia will linger longer. I always tell my patients to bring their bi-level machine to the hospital on the day of your planned surgery. Believe it or not, our hospitals don't have as nice BiPAP or bi-level machines as you guys do. So, and it's never going to fit as nicely as your home machine. So you always bring it in with you. Sometimes after getting extubated, you may not be able to breathe on room air. You might need an extra little bit of help with the, with the breathing. And they actually will put, put on the BiPAP machine onto you so that you can breathe better and then eventually go to room air. So it could be a transition step. Most of the issues with surgeries actually happen after the surgery, not in the surgical operating room. It's, it's, it's due to pneumonia because of difficulties with breathing or, or coughing out the, the, um, like your mucus, for example. Now comes the fun stuff. Okay, so these are now, this is the slide that shows like how, and all these posters in the back, it has to do with this slide and how hopefully we're going to try to change the course of this disease. Now, coming back to that toxic mRNA in the blue, um, it's, it's, a, it's the loop, that's the toxic one. And this picture shows that there are different ways of intervening. Remember the magenta balls? We, I'm just gonna call it muscle blind. Those, that's what's soaked up and not available for other genes, right? So what if we can actually use another molecule to do the job of the magenta ball, the, the, the muscle blind like protein. Let's see if we can do a substitute. So that is what some of our industry partners are doing. Dyne and Trada and Pepgen actually are going to give a molecule called an anti-sense oligonucleotide that can basically substitute for muscle blind. The problem is it's hard to get the medicine, the molecule into the cells. And all of these different companies have a different way of doing it. They have a different vehicle to get it into your cells. 
And the next one is um, expansion therapeutics. What if we could get a molecule to the toxic RNA, the, the, blue, the blue ribbon, the blue uh, hairpin loop, and maybe even cut the blue ribbon? By the way, I don't think I explained this well enough. That's not DNA, that's RNA. So it's not fundamentally cutting your DNA. It will be cutting your RNA, which is the next step. Um, that's what expansion therapeutics is hopefully trying to do. And Avidity Biosciences has a um, small interfering RNA that also basically um, um, helps, um, helps release muscle blind again. So notice that all, a lot of them are actually working on making muscle blind available to do its normal thing. And AMO uh, Pharma has Tidaglucib, which actually works outside of the toxic RNA. It has to do with a protein out in the muscles in the cell that has to that is potentially going to uh, help improve muscle strength. And I do have to apologize to my industry to our industry partners. I couldn't fit all of the the molecules on here. I just fit some of them, and I apologize for not doing all. Avididi Biosciences. Uh, very rapidly, I'm hoping this works as a primer so that you can actually look at the posters and look at all the industry partners and their talks, and it'll hopefully make a little bit more sense because it is very complicated. Um, Evidity Biosciences, for example, has a, um, a transferrin receptor um, antibody. That's what's depicted in the blue on the left. Um, and the oligo is the molecule, that is the medicine. So they connected the antibody to the, to the molecule and the antibody helps get the medicine into your cells. And you can see the medicine actually coming to that toxic RNA and hopefully interfering and releasing the green balls, which is their depiction of muscle blind. Oh, sorry. Um, Avidity has actually um, done animal studies, no, no major toxic, as um, um, toxicity was noticed. They're actually in phase one, two trials in adults called the MARINA study. And they're hoping to enroll 44 patients. And um, there is a what we call a safety and tolerability study. So they're not quite trying to measure how if it's working. They're just trying to make sure that it's safe and tolerated. Dyne Therapeutics, instead of taking the whole shebang and the whole antibody, they're going to actually just take a fragment of the antibody I apologize for not having a pointer, but you can see that the, the red and the blue bars is actually a part of the antibody on the left. And it's the exact same antibody as avidities, but it's not the whole thing. And they've connected their molecule to that fragment of the antibody. And that fragment helps get it to the cell and inside and uh, on the panel on the right, you can see that the, um, the, bl the light blue uh, molecule attaches again to the toxic RNA and releases muscle blind. They've also done animal studies, uh, non-human primates, so monkeys, and no bad effects were found. And they're hoping to do first in human studies very, very soon. I, this, this diagram is a little complicated, I apologize, but I took it directly off of the paper. Um, expansion therapeutics is having this special molecule. You see the little Pac-Man in the orange? That's the cutter. That's the one that hopes to cut the, um, the toxic hairpin loop because the, the two purple balls, which is their fancy molecule, knows how to find this, this toxic RNA and then cut it so that it doesn't do all of its bad downstream effects and thus releases muscle blind. Phase one trials are complete and now hopefully we'll have an industry update maybe today or, um, or perhaps tomorrow. Um, AMO Pharma has Tidaglucid. This one is a little complicated and this is by uh, Dr. Timench Timenchko's lab. And the toxic RNA is the squiggle in the middle on the diagram. And again, remember muscle blind is low, that kelf protein is high. And unfortunately a there's a special molecule called the glycogen synthase kinase that is high and it causes less proteins in your muscles and that causes muscle atrophy. So let's give a medication that inhibits that high protein. That's what the medicine does. And thus it actually decreases the activity of glycogen synthase kinase and actually causes increased protein synthesis and hopefully stronger muscles. 
And Trada has a similar um, molecule that is the ASO, and they've coupled it, they've attached it onto their vehicle um, to get it into the cells, which is the gold little squiggle. Um, is there a specialized proprietary uh, vehicle called an endosomal escape vehicle? You can see it coming to the edge of the cell, forming this bubble going inside the cell, and it has a way of escaping out of the bubble and then going into the nucleus. And it again finds the toxic RNA, which is the blue, um, blue line, blue squiggle, and, um, and thus releases muscle blind, which is in the right, which is in the uh, light blue. Preclinical studies are done. And finally, pepgin, again, has a peptide that they've attached the molecule to. And it does the same thing by releasing muscle blind after finding its way into the muscles. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a lot of downstream effects from that. And um, clinical trials are anticipated in 2023. Um, and that concludes my talk. Um, I would love to take some questions now. And please feel free to raise your hand so I can see you. And we'll also take questions from people on, uh, on the virtual side. Is uh, the muscle, the muscle blind or whatever it's called, is that um, what's responsible for turning the RNA into introns and exons or? It is responsible for actually stabilizing the RNA um, so that the RNA can be properly, can be, can be read basically. Yes, it's, an, it's a vital molecule for other genes as well, not just the DMPK gene. And unfortunately, those other genes don't get enough muscle blind because of how big the expansion is. Is the immune system affected? I know I have an immune issue, but is the immune system affected common, commonly? There is a possibility that the immune system is affected, but I, don't, I haven't read any specific data on in, in what way but I don't have any specific, it's not like you're prone to getting more infections or anything like that. Is that what, or are you wondering if there are autoimmune conditions? Yes, um, as to the direct correlation to the pathogenesis for low IgG levels, I am not aware of. So are you willing to discuss the differences between succinylcholine and non-depolarizing muscle relaxants in folks with this disease? Yes. So oh, you. Sorry, I'm kind of a plug. I'm an anesthesiologist. Yes. Um, so um, usually depolarizing muscle relaxants are actually much more dangerous. It actually can cause a prolonged effect in terms of how much weakness it causes. The non-depolarizing muscle agents, I, um, if a small dose is necessary, then it's probably okay. But succinylcholine in general is actually notorious for causing prolonged muscle weakness in many of our patients. Thank you. It seems uh, logical to me that the number of repeats might correlate to the length of the RNA strand. I was just wondering if that's accurate. Oh, yes, it does. So the, the longer you repeat on the DNA, the longer your, your RNA strand and the larger the hairpin loop, correct? Um, I have a comment and a question. My comment is succinylcholine will cause hyperkalemia, which can lead to cardiac death. That's the reason sucks shouldn't be used. Um, my question is, um, I have tremendous pain in my lower back on one side in particular. Um, it seems to be um, relieved by NSAIDs um, and topical NSAIDs. I've had an MRI, it's not neural. Would an injection be effective? It depends on whether your pain is caused by a nerve getting pinched or not. It's not, it's just pain right in the back, right? Unfortunately, I don't think a nerve an injection is actually helpful when there's no nerve component. The weakness, unfortunately, I think is what's mediating a lot of the back pain. Hi, yeah. I know that you mentioned in your speech that higher liver enzymes are common. Um, my doctor is currently treating, is currently having me take a blood test every six months to check about my higher 
liver enzymes because it's something he's concerned at. Is that, he should continue doing that or is it pretty much irrelevant because it's gonna be higher regardless of what I do? Yes, sir. So um, unfortunately, two of the, what we traditionally designate as liver enzymes are actually not just liver enzymes. Those muscle, those enzymes are found in muscle as well. So when, because of myotonic dystrophy, you have a high muscle enzyme level, like a CK is high, but so are these two specific liver enzymes. But they're not just liver enzymes, they're also muscle enzymes. Your doctor should look at enzymes that are very specific to the liver. I had mentioned bilirubins and GGT. If they are normal, then chances are you have nothing wrong with your liver. And indeed, it's he's just seeing your muscular dystrophy. Um, and it's not a liver problem. So I personally don't think that liver monitoring is necessary, especially if your liver numbers are normal. Sure. Okay, I have a Go question ahead. regarding, there's been a lot of discussion about the treatment going, penetrating the cell membrane. Mm -hmm. And is it an issue at all for penetrating the nucleus membrane? Ooh. Um, the I the um, concentration within the nucleus is an issue um, that we that is discussed in the research articles. I do not know if certain um, oligos, uh, meaning medications, are, are have any difference in the cell membrane versus the nuclear membrane. Perhaps um, our industry partners can actually speak their specific molecule to see if they've measured a difference. Um, um, in terms of their actual animal modeling of the of their specific delivery vehicle, but yes, you are right. the The ASO, the the oligo, which is the medication for the vast majority of these drugs, does need to get into the nucleus in order to um, mediate its effects. So you, yes, that is an issue. I just don't know. Um, how much of a difference there is. And yes, it is the issue with concentration of the, of the oligo, the medication in the nucleus. That is why the Ionis drug failed back in what, 2015 or so. The virtual attendee Kathleen asks, is BiPAP preferred over NIV, non-invasive ventilator? Oh, so BiPAP and not NIV are the same thing. So non-invasive ventilation actually refers to either CPAP or BiPAP, usually BiPAP or bi-level. Um, it means the same thing. I just use the more commonly used term. It is indeed NIV, non-invasive ventilation, as opposed to a actual ventilator, which is invasive because a tube needs to go down your throat or you need to have a tracheostomy with a tube connected to your throat. Thank you so much, Dr. Congressman. Thank you, everyone.